Go right ahead. Okay, thanks, Mary. Uh, good evening, everybody. So I've given I've given a bunch of lectures uh, in in the past years about music and astronomy. I've talked about the relationship between the two pursuits: composers who are inspired by astronomy and astronomers who are inspired by music. And a special lecture on hosts the planets and the lecture on on uh, the sounds, or more accurately, the translations of electromagnetic signals into sounds that are found in space and how they've been used both astronomically and also artistically. Um, so tonight I'm going to talk about movie music, which has a close connection with space because there are so many movies in which music is used to portray space. Um, so, but before we can tackle uh, uh, the question of how space is portrayed in music, we have to address a fundamental uh, aesthetic or artistic issue, which is how is it exactly that music portrays anything? Um, music is the most abstract of the arts. When, whether you're listening to, you know, math music like Bach's Art of the Fugue or a romantic favorite like Tchaikovsky's Romeo and Juliet or something really great like Baby Shark, um, music is an arrangement of sonic events in time, pitches of various frequencies with differing attack, duration, and decay, arranged in time according to various metric patterns. Unless there are words, how can it express anything? And let's face it, if the words are do 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 uh, how much can it really express anyway? Um, can music really portray anything or do all our emotional responses to music boil down to cultural conditioning? Um, people have been arguing about this for a long, long time. Uh, here are two great composers who were born about 20 years apart on the subject. Richard Strauss, the man who wrote Also Sprach Zarathustra, that's this one. Right. Um, Richard Strauss uh, said, um, I want to be able to depict in music a glass of beer so accurately that every listener can tell whether it is a Pilsner or a Kumbacher. Um, 20 years his junior was Igor Stravinsky, who wrote The Rite of Spring, which is one of the most ripped off pieces of music in Hollywood history. Um, and Stravinsky said, music is incapable of expressing anything but itself. Now, both of these guys liked to be naughty boys and make deliberately uh, strong statements, but um, that does sort of crystallize the, you know, the philosophical issue with music. Um, and, and this is the case with so many uh, useless arguments of this sort. The answer kind of lies in the middle. Cultural conditioning certainly does play a role uh, in how, in the emotional associations music has. Uh, if you've heard Wagner's Die Valkyra enough times and you've seen What's Opera Doc and Apoc Apocalypse Now uh, enough times, then you can't hear the ride of the Valkyries without certain extra musical associations. Um, but there also is undoubtedly acoustical science behind the emotional affects of music as well. Um, a perfect octave, uh, sounds more consonant, which means at rest, than a major third, which in turn sounds more consonant than a minor second. Right? And that has to do with the overtone series. Um, you know, when, when, when uh, certain notes, the overtones are, you know, are uh, uh, blended with each other almost perfectly, and certain combinations of notes, you have a clash of overtones that are next to each other. Um, so that creates a sense of, you know, a sense of dissonance. Um, also, there's a, there's a definite grammar, which is partially co uh, cultural conditioning and partially acoustic to tonal harmony, the, the chords that underlie most of the music we hear. Um, for instance, a seventh chord built on the fifth note of the scale, that's called a dominant seventh chord, is expected to resolve to a tonic chord. Um, if you play a chord progression and you work your way towards that dominant seventh, right, you build up an expectation and you can create tension by delaying a resolution so that when the resolution comes, it is fulfilling or you can flout uh, that resolution by uh, what's called a deceptive cadence, right? And go to the wrong chord, leaving people 
wanting you to somehow find your way back, right, to, to uh, home base, although we did it in the minor key there. Um, so this enables the development of drama at the foreground level, the middle ground level, and the background level in music. Uh, this is something that composers, especially from the, the, the classical era, which is roughly the second half of the 18th century and the beginning of the 19th century, so people like Haydn and Mozart and Beethoven, they had a perfect understanding of that process. And that's why uh, so, many, so many later composers writing for larger, louder, and more colorful orchestras couldn't write pieces that were quite as exciting as the Jupiter Symphony or Beethoven's Seventh or something like that. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. There's so much more, but there's not enough time to go into it all. Suffice to say that at some level, um, composing music is like engineering. You have to consider, metaphorically speaking, what materials you're working with, what stress tolerances, current flow, and various other design issues um, to get a desired emotional affect. Uh, by the way, I once told this to a colleague of mine at school who's the engineering professor. I said, I think the words I said is composing is a lot like engineering, except that people don't die if you do your job badly. And his response was, um, but they may want to, <laughs> which I thought was a good response. Um, so, so, um, so what does film music do? Let me go to a very famous moment from the film. Um, there we go. Um, so uh, is my little thing blocking the image here? Let me... Uh, that's a little better. So what does film music do? Um, music in a film or any dramatic work has three important tasks. One is it creates the world. And uh, the second, uh, that is kind of an important task, right? The second task is that it creates character. And then the third task is that it generates action. And um, if it's a film score, well, I'll add, I'll save that one for last. But so those are the three most important things that music does. And when I say creates a world, I mean, it, it tells you how to, how to view what you're seeing on screen. It, it, it backs up the image. Um, so let's look for a moment at this, at this little, you know, famous bit from Star Wars. Uh, uh, the world here is Tatooine, right? There's, a, there's a, a hot sunset on this desert planet with this magnificent binary sun hanging on the horizon. Um, and um, what's most important is that this is a world that's full of magic and adventure, but that magic and adventure is at this moment beyond the reach of the main character, right, Luke. And Luke in turn is a young man who's yearning for that adventure, but um, at the moment feels a deep frustration in the fact that it's not attainable. And the action in this scene is mostly psychological. He walks out, he looks at the sunset, he feels that pull uh, that that pull towards the heroic, towards the you know the force, um, and uh, then he just turns away in in reg resignation. So let's listen to the scene, and uh, this would be a good time if you realize that for any reason you're not hearing this, let Mary know and she'll stop me. But we tried this and it was working before. does the music do there? Um, well, first of all, it, 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 it doesn't spend a lot of time creating the world, but it does it kind of deftly uh, with the harp and the flutes at the beginning, generating that sort of twilight magic. And then the melody is in the minor key. But instead of going to the, to the, uh, the, relative, the regular minor four chord, it goes to, right? Um, and it does that exactly at the moment when you are, your, your vision and Luke's vision is focused on that incredible double star. So it, it does sort of generate the magic. Um, 
the other thing that the, that the, the thing that the music really spends time on in this case is the action, even though the action is very limited, right? It's just strictly psychological. The melody, um, like a lot of heroic melodies, doesn't move up by step, it leaps upwards, right? And it keeps striving to get higher and higher. until it reaches the, the tonic note, the key note at the top, uh, and then it drops, drops back down. Right, um, and it, when it hits that top note, it doesn't do it on a tonic chord, but instead it gives you kind of magical sounding uh, flattens. Right. Um, and it generates perfectly that sort of pull towards something heroic and then that sort of retreat from it at the end when he turns away in, uh, in disgust. And it doesn't hurt, which is what the last point here suggests, uh, that this melody is strikingly reminiscent of one of the leading motives from Wagner's Ring Cycle, um, which sounds like this. Right, um, which is specifically in Wagner's Ring Cycle associated with its kind of Luke-like hero, Siegfried. Um, film score composers walk a tightrope between originality and leading the audience exactly where the director wants the audience led, which means having to reference culturally familiar things. So, um, whoops. So let me move on to the next slide here. Um, if if my I don't know if what you're seeing on screen uh, is my my little let me just uh, um, there were expressive techniques uh, or I should say the expressive techniques that you hear in in John Williams's score were not new to film score composers uh, they took a lot of their cues from the Romantic composers of the 19th century who made this kind of programmatic writing writing that depicts things um, like which beer you're drinking they made it into their bread and butter. Um, there are any number of examples, but I've chosen this one because I love it and because I can excerpt it after hearing just the first couple of minutes. This is a piece by um, the great Russian composer Alexander Borodin. It's called In the Steppes of Central Asia. Steppes meaning the big uh, desert grasslands that are sort of trackless and vast, ranging through, uh, through, through Central Asia. Um, it's a little bit of imperialist propaganda from the 19th century, but don't mind that. Let me read to you the description of it that, um, that Borodin wrote in the, in the score. He said, in the silence of the monot monotonous steppes of Central Asia is heard the unfamiliar sound of a peaceful Russian song. From the distance, we hear the approach of horses and camels and the bizarre and melancholy notes of an Oriental melody. A caravan approaches, escorted by Russian soldiers, and continues safely on its way through the immense desert it disappears slowly. We don't need to go further because that's past where we're going, but you have the idea, this vast open space, you hear the Russian song uh, and, uh, and the indigenous song uh, and uh, the, the movement of the caravan and they blend together because we all get together, we all get along and work in perfect harmony and you're flourishing under our benign protection, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so let's listen to the opening couple of minutes.
so on. There's your 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 caravan melody. Bora didn't know how to write tunes, you know. Um, so it's pretty clear what's going on there, right? You have your simple diatonic Russian song. And uh, you have the caravan song and you have the, the kind of like tread of the caravan moving along. Um, but what's really remarkable about this excerpt and also remarkably economical is the way that Borodin portrays the vastness and unchanging barrenness of the Central Asian steppes. A single high E, an octave above that note, um, way up on the violins, a harmonic. The high register suggests a wide registral uh, range and since nothing else is happening with that, within that wide range, it suggests a vast kind of emptiness. Um, this, of course, is really a portrayal of space. It's just a space that has uh, atmosphere and some camels and where it rains on Fridays and everything, but it's still uh, uh, space. So if you listen, I'm going to go back and play the very beginning and talk over it a little bit, um, which will probably ruin the sound, but just so you get the idea, it's not hard to imagine space, the final frontier, right? It's not hard to imagine that um, that could have been the beginning of Star Trek where the exact same device is used um, for that purpose. So how do we show space? Let me go uh, to my next slide. Um, how do we show outer space in music? It kind of depends on what we want. And I picked a few examples from 2001 um, because it was a movie that kind of literally changed my life. I saw it when I was nine years old, and I can confidently say um, that it was one of those early experiences that nudged me strongly in the direction of music as a career, which is an odd reaction to it, but that's what it did. Um, and although you may know that Alfred North, who was an eminent film score composer who did Spartacus and a few other movies, Alfred North did write an original score for the movie, but Kubrick didn't like it and used the classical pieces he'd been using to edit the movie to. So it's those familiarly scored scenes I want to examine, specifically three, which use music to show space travel in very different lights. Um, here's the first one, it starts very quietly. Whoever recorded this fades up, but you all know what's coming. You can see it on the, uh, so let me play it. Let me move my thing over here and uh, play it.
I'd like to keep going with that, but I, I, uh, I'm just going to skip to the very end because, uh, let's see, oh, from about here. So um, I have to say we outgrow certain of our childish likes, but um, I still have more of a, a love for Strauss waltzes than anybody, any 21st composer from 21st century composer from New Jersey uh, ought to have, you know. <laughs> but anyway, um, that of course is Johann Strauss's uh, waltz or set of waltzes called uh, the Blue Danube or on the beautiful Blue Danube. Strauss, by the way, was not related to the other Strauss, to Richard Strauss. Johann Strauss came from a famous dynasty of waltz composers. It's important to remember that um, he's considered classical today, but in his day, he was a popular artist. He was the leader of Vienna's preeminent dance band, basically. Uh, and it's important to understand that that's what this piece is and what it was written for. Um, and that kind of explains its piece in the scene. The slow introduction at the beginning is what in a dance hall would have been the part where the where the women in their gowns and the men in their plumed shakos and whatever uh, sort of pair off and you know check off their dance cards or whatever, and then the first waltz begins actually at the moment where the Pan Am space clipper appears, um, the the um, and that's where the dance begins and each successive waltz has to fit into the the dance steps. So Strauss didn't wasn't able to expand and do things that were musically necessarily outside the, you know, the realm of what a waltz had to be. Eight bar phrases, 32 bars all together, and so on. Everything is, is according to, is graceful and controlled according to specific rules. And it kind of communicates the kind of gravitational dance that's going on in that, in that scene, right? I went to the end so you could see the the, uh, the space clipper starting to rotate to match the, the rotation of the, of the space station, uh, the space station Hilton, I guess. Um, and there's also a German word that's associated with Johann Strauss's music. It's one of those untranslatable words like schadenfreude, but in this case, it's gemütlichkeit, which has connotations of like coziness, comfort, good cheer, and satisfaction. Um, and it's a word that's always been associated with, with, uh, with Johann Strauss's music. This scene shows space as something tamed and under control, which in this movie, we, you know, is an illusion that we shortly see destroyed. Um, so let's look at the next scene. I'm actually skipping a little bit in the movie, but um, this is a scene that happens 18 months later in the movie when they've suddenly had to hastily arrange a manned mission to Jupiter where they've never before been. Uh, actually, in the book, it's Saturn, but uh, in the movie, it's Jupiter because Kubrick had trouble with rings. Um, and, um, and so this is a goal at the very limit of possibility, crossing a gulf of space that, even in the world of 2001, had never been uh, crossed before. So, and this scene is very famous, even though nothing happens in it. Um, it's famous partially because of the special effects, uh, but also the music. Um, this is the scene in which we're introduced to uh, Dave Bowman and Frank Poole and Hal, and uh, although we only see Hal in this scene, we don't meet him yet, uh, and, and the gigantic ship, the Discovery, that's carrying them out towards Jupiter. Let's listen to this. Uh, I wish I could play all of this, but I'll play a couple of minutes.
okay. Uh, if I remember right, actually, Dave doesn't come in until the very end of this scene. Um, that piece is the adagio from a Soviet era ballet called Guyana by uh, a Soviet Armenian composer, Aram Khachaturian. It's the same ballet that the very famous saber dance comes from, right? That one. Um, and um, in the ballet itself, this music is meant to express the confusion and unhappiness of the title character when she discovers that her husband is a criminal. Um, but the lamenting character of the music, well, you know, comes to a very different effect in this scene. And the lamenting character, by the way, is communicated among other things by the use of uh, what really amounts to a musical meme that's much older than the internet, a meme that goes back to the middle ages. And that is the idea of a falling half step. That interval being associated with lamenting or despair. Um, there are so many pieces that do that, that it, it, it really is effectively a meme and composers are always exploiting it. Um, so um, what made this wonderful piece attractive to Kubrick also was the bleakness of its scoring. Until the very last two measures of the piece, there are only two voices, the violas and the cellos. Um, that's it. Um, and what better way, again, to communicate sort of the emptiness and the loneliness of space. Um, so the tragic character of the music juxtaposed with that empty backdrop and the, the inertness of the ship and the numbing routine of the humans within. I mean, you know, uh, inside, the, inside the front end of the discovery, it's rotating, which is to generate a sense of gravity. I think it's actually, from a scientific accuracy standpoint, a little too small to do that without making people nauseous. But be that as it may, it's rotating like that, and it makes Frank look just like a gerbil or a hamster on a wheel, right? Um, and so uh, it generates this sense of like almost unbearable routine and loneliness, far different from the Gemütlichkeit of uh, near Earth space that you hear in Strauss. So here's one other little scene from, uh, from the movie. Um, and let me move again. Um, so this scene actually took place before that. It's a scene of space travel uh, that across the surface of the moon when Dr. Floyd and his fellow scientists are traveling towards uh, the spot, is it on uh, Tycho? I don't remember, but where the monolith is buried. Um, they're inside that little shuttlecraft eating, uh, if I remember right, chicken salad sandwiches um, and talking in a totally banal way about you know, uh, things. Uh, but you hear in the background um, this incredibly eerie music, which is by uh, the composer Georgi Ligeti, who just died uh, about 15 years ago. Um, Ligeti, in my opinion, was, was um, the greatest of the sort of European avant-gardists from the 1960s. Um, I couldn't find a clip of this scene, exactly this scene, which is the scene I wanted, and I'll explain why later. So I found a still image and said, and a recording of the music, which we'll listen to while you look at the still image, which is fine because nothing much happens in this scene. You just see the transport uh, uh, traveling across the surface of the moon. So this is Ligeti's Lux Eterna. there in the interest of time. Um, 
the creepy crawliness of that piece derives from a signature Ligeti uh, um, technique, which is using what are called micro cannons. A cannon is like a round, uh, um, voices that are in very close imitation so that um, they keep sort of resolving in and out or going in and out of phase with each other and creating dissonances and consonances and so on. Um, uh, and uh, there's one canon like that going on in the altos and another one going on in the tenors and octave lower. And then when you uh, put together with that is the fact that the, the canons are sort of fanning out. So you start out with one pitch, an F, and gradually build out into sort of a wedge shape, higher and, and higher and higher and lower and lower. Um, that's, you know, so it creates, it generates a sense of very weird development as the piece is sort of uh, concretely expanding. Um, I picked these particular scenes for a reason, and that is that all three of them depict very neutral and static scenes of space travel with almost no emphasis on the people involved. Uh, so the music in all three of the scenes is really about space. It's world creating music, in other words. Um, and note how differently space is portrayed. It's cozy and controlled. It's unbearably lonely, or there's this lurking strangeness and menace to it. And now, you know, in your heads, um, do a little thought experiment. Imagine switching the music for those scenes. Imagine if watching this traveling across the moon, you were listening to the Blue Danube or, or uh, the Adagio from Guyana or somewhere. Imagine the discovery gliding along to the Blue Danube. Um, and uh, you get a sense of how music creates a world. So one of the things about 2001 is that, of course, the music as we know it um, all came from pre-existing classical pieces, even though Lux Eterna was written about two years before the movie was made. Um, and Ligeti was not overwhelmingly thrilled to have it used without his permission until he started making lots of money from it. And then I think he was happy. Um, so uh, um, most films have scores written specially for them and the composers have to capture the direction, direct excuse me, vision and music, their role in shaping the audience's experience is similar to the cameraman's or the production designer, like I said earlier. And because they know what familiar buttons they have to press, it's their job, their duty really, to sound like what the audience already knows so they can exploit the cultural conditioning that does exist in previous existing works. So great film composers necessarily are chameleons. Um, John Williams derived the main title uh, from Star Wars, this one. Mm from um, a 1940s Ronald Reagan movie called King's Row, scored by the Hollywood composer Eric Korngold. Um, and he did that because he knew that George Lucas, in creating Star Wars, was paying homage to the movie serials of the 1940s. Uh, and Jerry Goldsmith, when he scored Alien, uh, dipped liberally into Ligeti's coloristic palette uh, and threw in a reference, by the way, also to the planets, uh, if you listen carefully, you'll hear a reference to Saturn from the planets uh, in the beginning of Alien because he wanted to create this idea of, again, of strangeness and menace. Um, one of the effects you'll hear, and you don't hear it, uh, you didn't hear it in the little excerpt of Lux Eterna we played, but it is in Ligeti a lot, is what happens when the strings are, the string instruments are hitting their strings, not with the hair on their bow, but with the wood part of the bow, and they're hitting it on the other side of the tailpiece. So you get this very strange percussive sound. Um, you'll hear that at the very beginning. Here's a little bit of the credits to Alien. I'm just trying to find my cursor there. The chords at the beginning of Saturn from the planets. Are quoted at the same pitch even he didn't bother transposing them. Um, in that example, but also all those all those effects 
again, borrowed from the music that would have evoked those associations uh, in the audience. Um, so um, one of the other aspects of space, especially in early science fiction movies before space was actually uh, visited by, by human beings was the fact that it was futuristic, right? And you've all heard, I've played this before, so I'm just gonna play a little bit, but the movie Forbidden Planet, which was released in 1956, um, used was the first movie to use a fully electronic score. And that, that was cutting edge in more sense than one because all sounds in those days were generated by analog sound generators and filtered to get frequencies and then painstakingly cut and spliced on, on, you know, from, uh, on blocks and, and then uh, put into loops and, and looped around multiple tape recorders and so on. Um, new technology always generates new conventions. The whole idea of looping, which is something that we all, you know, we hear in all kinds of music today, whether it's electronic or not, um, was partially what was simply easy to do in, in electronic music. Um, so this piece was created, or th this film score was created right at the time that some of the pioneering pieces of electronic music were being created. And about 10 years before the Beach Boys and the Beatles uh, uh, started to use it in their albums like Pet Sounds and Sgt. Peppers. Um, one problem was there wasn't a, a library of cultural, uh, culturally conditioned affect to this music. So it doesn't suggest much more than futuristicness. Um, let me, there we go. Amazing, actually, for a for a corny 1950s science fiction movie, there was a lot of really cool stuff about about uh, about uh, Forbidden Planet, but the score was really one of them. And, and uh, yes, introducing Robbie the robot, I must say, cutting against the idea of it being futuristic was the, the you know the fact that Leslie Nielsen was in it. But, um, you know, so let's turn our attention for a minute to Star Trek. Um, I couldn't find a. I couldn't, wow, <laughs> someone, someone dropping some pots and pans there. Um, I couldn't find a clip of the, of the, uh, a fully legal clip of the beginning of Star Trek that the, that the, uh, that PowerPoint would agree to upload. But um, I did find this version of the, of the original main title theme. It's just been played by, uh, 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 and recorded with better sound quality, and it doesn't have the voiceover, but you can imagine pretty clearly, you've all seen the opening credits enough. Um, this is the original main title by Alexander Courage. Um, you can hear that high note that you heard at the beginning of, of Bored in Step of Central Asia. You can hear the evocation of the vastness of space with the added element of this upwardly surging fanfare, right? To suggest uh, heroicness. Um, and then all of a sudden the main theme begins and, um, you know, I still think since I was alive then as an impressionable, impressionable youngster that it reminds me of all like commercials for cars that I saw back then, you know, the, the, like uh, cars from the era immediately after tail fins. Um, you know, so it sounds like some kind of like 1967 Bonneville or something. Um, it's interesting. It doesn't really suggest anything uh, um, connected with space to me, except for maybe William Shatner. So here's the original Star Trek theme. You've all heard it, it's a minute long.
that one in the middle. One thing about that theme is that it keeps jumping up to higher intervals, right? The next one, right? Um, like it's striving upwards to go boldly where none have gone before. Um, one little factoid that, that is interesting in, in relation to that, even back in the 18th century, melodies that started with a bang going upwards, um, uh, like this one from Mozart, let's say, right? Melodies like that were called rocket themes, even back then. So uh, it's, it's kind of interesting. Um, so um, by contrast, here is, let's jump forward about, about, uh, about a dozen years to the first Star Trek movie. And this movie featured the, the, um, the melody by Jerry Goldsmith again that was later used for Star Trek The Next Generation. Um, and this theme is much more heroic in a way, um, but it also is much more ponderous than that original sort of sleek Bonneville that, that was the first Star Trek theme. It kind of changed and it fitted the difference in character between say Captain Picard and Captain, uh, Captain Kirk. Um, it, it fit the character of the original of the, excuse me, of the next generation much better. But in this movie, uh, the way it's used is really interesting. This is the scene, it, I, I think it first appears in this scene other than in the main credits where, where uh, Kirk is seeing for the first time in years, the old enterprise while it's in dry dock. And um, uh, what this succeeds in doing is turning this scene into like, uh, um, forgive me if there are young ones present, but like enterprise porn, right? I mean, it's like, it fetishizes the, the, this ship. Uh, so let's, let's watch it. I can't play all of it, unfortunately, because it's about four minutes long, but uh, you'll, you'll see what I mean. much louder, more emphatic version of the theme later, but it's really kind of uh, funny to me uh, uh, that it, it, it has this kind of like, this kind of like uh, uh, just looking longingly at the ship and it's, it's uh, because it's, because its job is to reintroduce audiences that have been yearning for new Star Trek for a decade to say, here we are, we're back again, right? And all your nostalgia is validated. Um, the, the, uh, and the theme is a great theme, by the way. Um, the, I, I want to say one thing also to give some props to Stanley Kubrick here. This movie was made 10 years after 2001, but it doesn't look half as good, right? <laughs> um, all right, so here's a movie that some of you may not have seen. Uh, has anybody ever seen the movie Dark Star? Well, I don't know. I can't hear your answers, but uh, it was a 1974 dark comedy, I guess, made by John Carpenter, who hadn't yet made Halloween. Um, and it's about uh, the scruffy three-man crew of a ship whose mission is to destroy planets that threaten the stability of stellar systems that might otherwise be hospitable to life. Don't ask. Um, 
and the three-man crew is is experiencing uh, a series of various existential crises, including um, including one of their intelligent bombs that they use to destroy planets uh, suddenly becoming conscious and deciding that it it wants to take over the ship and or blow it up. And there's a, and uh, my favorite line from this movie, in fact, the only line I can remember is where the the protagonist wants to know what to say to the bomb to convince it not to do that. And he's told, teach it phenomenology, <laughs> which is a great line. Um, anyway, the movie begins with the crew in the ship listening to their favorite music, which is kind of country stoner music. Um, and the fancy word for music in a film or an opera or any kind of dramatic work for music that uh, comes from within the world of the movie itself is diegetic music. So for instance, the cantina band's music in, in Star Wars is diegetic music because someone on the stage in the, in the cantina is playing it. Um, but in this case, the diegetic music becomes the background music for the opening credits. And in its own way, it shows space to be a lonely and nostalgic place. If you listen closely, the song has relativistic lyrics. Um, I don't know if we'll hear all of it, but in the case of this country stoner anthem, um, my baby didn't run over my dog or steal my pickup truck. She just got much older, much faster than I did uh, as observed from my frame of reference. And the song, by the way, is by John Carpenter, although the lyrics are by somebody else. So here's the credits to, to Dark Star. Let's have some music in here, Boiler. Sure thing. two more slides in case people are concerned. Um, one of the kinds of music that's become kind of universal in the last, in the last uh, several decades is minimalism. Minimalism is an aesthetic that has been a major player in concert music since the 1960s. Um, it was born as an acoustical realization of the possibilities uncovered by the new electronic sounds of the time and as a reaction to the academic modernism that was pervasive at the time, especially in musical academia. So minimalist composers like Philip Glass, Steve Reich, Michael Torkey, Michael Nyman, and Hans Zimmer uh, have conquered the concert hall and especially the screen. In cinema, minimalism is also a reaction against what is seen as the kind of ham-fisted emotional telegraphing and Mickey Mousing of earlier cinematic eras. By Mickey Mousing, I mean music that is exactly choreographed to the action on screen, right? When you see a cartoon and it has this. Right, and it's choreographed to each footstep and so on. That's Mickey Mouse. So what exactly is minimalism? Minimalism uh, is, uh, minimalist music is not short in duration necessarily, nor does it necessarily lack for density of notes the Cacciatorian Adagio we heard earlier is austere, but it's absolutely not minimalistic. Um, what minimalism is, is a style that builds up maximal possible density, complexity, and structure out of an absolute minimum of musical material. And in its pure form, without the harmonic grammar or linear logic that adds direction to traditional music. Um, therefore, it creates duration without that kind of dynamic quality, because that dynamic quality is what gives music the dramatic quality that minimalists are partially reacting against. Most minimalist works are strongly tonal, 
in the sense of being pitch centered, but unlike traditional music, at least, uh, or at least theoretically, not unidirectional. They could conceivably be played backwards, in other words, and have the same effect. Uh, so therefore, they're well suited to a movie like Interstellar, uh, which is focused on the funny effects that gravity has on time. That's a Hans Zimmer score, by the way. Um, uh, minimalism, minimalism is a great tool for building up suspense also um, through the tension inducing repetition of very small cells. Tension is enhanced in this scene by piling on detail to the numbing repetition of the simplest possible motive. It's basically one note uh, uh, separated in time. The underplaying of the action um, enhances the tension. Just think of how this scene would be scored if it were from a movie from the 1950s. Um, let's, let's just play it first of all. Oops. Uh, again, I, I don't have time to play all of it, unfortunately, but we'll listen to some. This is just incredible music. So throughout that whole scene, the score consists basically of the note E, right? Um, one thing I should mention, or two things I should mention, uh, and it, it becomes, you know, it's a very, obviously very tense situation. Um, the score to Interstellar is not entirely minimalist. The very next big set piece when, when Matthew McConaughey goes into the black hole is uh, kind of a pared down Wagnerian aesthetic based on appoggiaturas. Those are distant notes that resolve upwards. Whoops. Right, that's an appoggiatura. Um, and the whole scene is, is, uh, is, is, uh, is based on that and therefore it's very directional. Um, if you have the chance, watch the two scenes back to back and, uh, and you can hear the different, the different emotional affect. Also, one reason why minimalism is so widely used in film scores, and this is a cynical thing to say, but it, it, it's essentially true, is that it's very easy to fill up maximal time spans with, with uh, comparatively less effort. Right? Um, OK. Um, perhaps the most notorious piece of avant-garde music ever written is, um, and, and I, use the word, <laughs> I use the word music in earnest, but I use the word written in quotation marks. Uh, and that's John Cage's Tacit, right? That's the piece that lasts four minutes and 33 seconds and during which the performer plays nothing, right? I'm not here to discuss the merits of that great work, but since space is the place where no one can hear you scream, silence would seem to be the perfect musical medium for depicting space. And of course, Kubrick did it in 2001 during the scene in which Bowman tries to recover uh, Frank Poole's body. But one of my favorite examples of film scoring ever is the diegetic beginning of contact. Um, you hear the radio signals of Earth diminishing and disappearing as we get farther from home until there's just silence in the world. Uh, and then we're snapped back into the head of young Ellie, that's the main character, as she calls out for contact on a ham radio. 
It's not scientifically accurate because for one thing, the synchronization of the voyage away from Earth with the diminishing radio signals is all wrong. Um, and for another, space is full of radio signals with or without Richard Nixon and FDR and all the other things you hear. Uh, but it makes its point really brilliantly. Without contact, we are alone, calling out for connection, like the main character in the movie. And uh, in fact, the alien that she meets at the end of the movie says as much to her uh, uh, when he says, you feel so lost, so cut off, so alone, but you're not. See, in all our searching, the only thing we found that makes the emptiness bearable is each other, um, which is the, the message of the movie. But let's listen to the opening scene. Um, W9GFO. CQ, this is W9GFO here. Come back. CQ. CQ. This is W9GFO here. Come back. I don't think uh, silence was ever used better in a, in a film score than in that scene. And so uh, here we all are on Zoom making contact, right? Uh, I just finish off with this one little point counterpoint here. Uh, as Friedrich Nietzsche once said, uh, life uh, without music, life would be a mistake. Uh, but Aaron Copeland, on the other hand, said, if a literary man puts two words together about music, one of them will be wrong. Um, uh, thank you all. And uh, let me know if anybody has any questions. OK, um, you can hear me now, John, right? Yes. Right now, right now we have one question from Frank. Did the classical astronomers strive to observe musicality to the movements of the heavenly bodies? Absolutely, Kepler most, most prominently, right? Kepler uh, actually wrote, Kepler deduced that the, 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 the planets uh, together created a harmony that was uh, a second inversion D major triad 
Um, and that, that troubled him a great deal because uh, second inversion chords are dissonant. Um, and that, that you know, uh, was not commensurate with the idea of, of, um, of the perfection of the heavens, which was you know, the, the ancient Greek convention. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna close the SharePoint and just be a hold on a second. Um, I don't know if anybody has any other questions. I can start uh, moving everybody over to panelists. Okay, Aaron and Alan, Annie. This looks like there's a question here. Hold on. Yeah, there's oh there is another question. Yeah, go ahead and see. Can you get it? I think. Yeah. Do, well, that was, do our radio waves only go out to the Horsehead Nebula? I don't think they get as far as the Horsehead Nebula because the Horsehead Nebula is, we've had, well, no, the Horsehead Nebula is more than 100 light years away, isn't it? Uh, and we've only had been emitting radio signals for like 120 years. So uh, they probably don't make it all the way out to the Horsehead Nebula. But certainly it's not, for instance, um, all the way, you know, just, you don't have to go all the way, uh, or let me put it this way, if you go all the way back to here, Nixon, it won't take you out to the orbit of Jupiter. I do realize that she's a child in that scene, but, but um, you know. Um, so in, actually in the case of that movie, the radio waves are have not gone as far because it starts about 30 or 40 years earlier. Okay, I'm promoting everybody to panelists. Unfortunately, I can only do it one at a time. Let me see Is that. Okay, we answered that question. That was a great presentation. Yeah. Well, thank you. So a question of mine as a physicist, you know, trying to mechanistically break these things down. What is it about minor keys that just has like that sort of dark feeling to it? Right. Um, I think that it has to do with, um, you know, at some level, it has to do with with the uh, with the overtone series because the third of the major key is much um, much uh, more fundamental in the overtone series, right? It's the it's uh, it's five times the uh, well twice three four yes, five times the fundamental frequency to get the major third. Um, whereas the minor thirds quite a bit higher on the overtone series, so it does create a little bit of a of a of a, um, a dissonance when they're together. Um, this is, um, however, there's also probably conditioning involved. So, for instance, a major chord has a major third in it, but it also has a minor third between the third and the fifth. Right, a minor third sounds like the beginning of green sleeves. And, so, so um, but major and minor chords both have a major third and a minor third in them, but the but the minor third above the fundamental is is a little bit more troubling to the ear than the major third above the fundamental. That's just my. And by the way, in the Middle Ages, those uh, thirds were not considered perfect consonances. You would never end a piece like that. You would end with an open perfect perfect intervals only, fourths, fifths, and octaves. Um, because there was no, it was because they were very basic to the overtone series and it was easy to tell whether they were locked in tune or not. So, so there is something sort of physically different in terms of the harmonics. It's not just a cultural thing. Yes, I, I think so. I mean, again, you have an argument that goes from like one pole to the other. I'm probably, I'm probably more towards the, towards the acoustical properties side than some people are. But I, I do feel that way. It's like if you went to some you know, island in the middle of the Indian Ocean where they've never heard our music before and you started playing something in a minor key, they go, uh-oh, there's trouble. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting how much there is universal in music between different cultures that, you know. So everyone recognizes, for instance, what's called octave equivalence that, you know, we have, this note is called C, and that note's called C, right? And we recognize that somehow there is something that is the same about those notes, even though one is twice the frequency of the other. Um, there isn't any culture that doesn't feel that way, although there have been some 
artificial attempts to do that. There were two. Like our camera's not working, but I really don't care. Yeah, I, don't see, I don't see it. There were two acousticians named Boland and Pierce who created a scale that was based on having the twelfth be the fundamental, uh, 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 fundamental, you know, the equivalent of the octave, basically. Data stream is working. I'm not worried about it. Hey, Ray Sharp, we can see you, right? Right now, I'm using both the uh, desktop and my cell phone. Um, can you hear me? Yep, yep. yep. I'm wondering whether you're hearing me from my phone or from my desktop. Guess what? I have yeah. the uh, desktop muted, so you're actually hearing me from my phone. Uh, yeah, I think it's your phone. That works better. Your beard is magnificent, by the way, Ray. There is between me and Brian, though. Look. Brian. <laughs> <laughs> The other thing is, every once in a while, you see my left hand covers the uh, the, the uh, camera, unless maybe if I go to portrait mode. Yeah, okay. <laughs> there, there we go. I think you guys have to have a beard off. You have to get out the ruler. Yes. <laughs> don't say off when you're talking about the beard. So. That just says the zoom. No, 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 no. The Just here. above that, that's the bottom. John, sorry. Yeah. What are you yes. playing over there? Is that a keyboard or a piano or right what? Oh, it's, it's a keyboard. It's it's the MIDI controller I use um, for composing on the computer. It's it's um it's oh, there a we are. really rinky dink little keyboard. You don't need to have a fancy thing to run your computer. I didn't need a rinky dink keyboard. Okay. Yeah. I was looking, I'd like to buy a keyboard, but I was thinking of getting something a little bit better than a Ricky Dink keyboard. But well, it depends. <laughs> if you have a piano already, it depends on whether it's like substituting for a piano or not. Yeah, it's substituting you know. for a piano. Um, there are, I mean, this is a Yamaha. There's some really good Yamaha models that like we use at my school in our piano studio that where the keyboard is weighted so that it feels like a piano keyboard. Yeah, yeah I like that less. idea. I don't remember the model name and number. I could try it. If you remind me, I can try and find out for you next or by next week. All right. Well, uh, not yet. I have to make but, space for it, but uh, I would like to get a piano back in the house. I, had, I took piano lessons and had a piano, but when I moved back to my mother's house, I couldn't bring it with me. I had no place to put it. Did you go there are a bunch of companies making digital pianos. Related to his work. Yes, did you make it to the pool this week? I put my feet in. I put my bathing suit on today. Oh. Fine. <laughs> so. Hey, John, I'd like to ask a question. Sure, Bonnie. No. Go ahead, uh, um, Bonnie. You were saying that you play two notes, and two notes would indicate danger or stress or oh, coming. Oh, uh, lamenting. Coming lamenting. That's yeah. Lamenting. That reminds me of the two notes that they use in Jaws. Right. It's the same two notes, but in the opposite order, right? In Jaws, they go up. Yeah. But we're talking about going down. Like the, uh, the Tchaikovsky Pathetique Symphony. Right? Or, or there's a whole bunch of pieces like that that do that. Um, that sound has always been associated since at least the Middle Ages with like pathos. Whereas the jaws going up, it's more associated with kind of menace, right? Um, I don't know if that was John Williams's first score, but that was a pretty brilliant score too. 